Thanks so much for having me. Can you all hear me okay? Cool. Um, and thank you, Alyssa, for that land acknowledgement. Um, before I get started on doing a whole presentation for us, I actually want to invite folks just to come into your body for a minute, since our conversation today is about embodiment and about how we change our relationships to our own bodies, to the land that we're on, to the ways that we nourish ourselves. Um, I really just want to invite you to come into your body for a minute. And if you're able um, to put your feet on the ground, to uh, feel into your spine, and just to take a couple of breaths here together. We're about a year into this pandemic. Um, we've all been through a lot. We've all spent a lot of time on screens together but this is part of us connecting to ourselves and connecting to being here together. So I invite you to take one breath just into the center of your body and into your core and really feel what it is to breathe from that place. And I invite us to take one breath where we feel the back of our bodies and feel the front of our bodies remembering our ancestors, both blood and political, that Alyssa spoke to. When we think about the land that we're on, the ways we're moving forward together as we breathe into the front of our bodies. And to take one breath to the sides of our body, really feeling our rib cages expand, really feeling the breath of what it is for us to be here in community together and to be growing together. And as you take that breath into the community that we're in together, really feeling your sides, if you're able to put your hands even on your side ribs doing that, feel that expansion, start to feel the length of your body from the top of your head through your spine, if you're able. And remember your own dignity. We're all here to reconnect to that sense of ourselves, to our own sense of worth and our value, even as we talk about the systems that we're within and how we work to disrupt those systems in ways that honor the dignity of all of us and of all life. Thank you for breathing with me. I am going to invite you to keep that feeling in your body, do what you need to do while I transition to sharing some slides. Um, as was already mentioned, my name is Navina Khanna. I'm the director of the Heal Food Alliance. And I am talking to you right now uh, from unceded Ohlone territory. I'm here in Oakland. Um, and I wanna take a minute just to honor the land that I'm on right now, as well as um, honoring the land that I'm from. And so the, the, my peoples are from Punjab, which if you look at this um, picture that's here is Northwest India bordering with Pakistan. And I just lost everything. Shoot. We will just take a minute while Navina rejoins us, Navina and her slides. Don't forget to keep breathing, everyone.
Perhaps one thing I can do is share, since I'm here and I can share screen, I'll share the website of the Heal Food Alliance for those of you who have not seen it. Um, oh, here she is. Welcome back, Navina. <laughs> Sorry about that. Did you lose your connection? I just completely died. Um, but we're all still here. We're all still here. I was just about to, to share my screen and show everybody the Heal Food Alliance website <laughs> while you're reconnecting. You can, you can uh, do the presentation. But now you're here, so, so it's all <laughs> Cool, I'm gonna try again and um, hope that that doesn't happen this time. So um, y'all can still hear me? You can still see me? Okay. Um, so just again to say, you know, where my where my peoples are from, are from this northwest region of India, border with Pakistan, um, an area called Punjab, which is traditionally a rich, rich agricultural land. And um, Punjab itself is named for the five rivers that feed it from the Himalayas into the soil. And so part of what I think about when I think about us reconnecting to the land and reconnecting to ourselves and reconnecting to our cultures with food as our most intimate connection to those things. I think about my ancestors and their hands in that soil, um, nourishing their communities for many, many generations, which now is impossible for so many of them because of the giant corporations whose chemicals and fertilizers and seeds and pesticides have destroyed the soil there, destroyed the waterways there, um, and destroyed so many farmers' ability to stay on the land. So that's part of why I'm here talking to you about where we are right now, um, the bodies that we're in, and, and really the moment that we're in together. And just to look for a moment together at the moment that we're in. So you all have seen probably some version of this, right? That um, we know that all the experts, all the scientists, um, anyone with credibility has said that the planet is warming, climate chaos is accelerating, and that we have essentially nine years to completely change the ways that we live, not to avert climate change completely, but to avert the worst possible situation, right? So we're probably gonna have at least 1.5 degrees of warming. And what we're trying to avert together is having two degrees of warming, which would mean co complete collapse of our systems and complete collapse of uh, any species ability to thrive. And we're seeing the impacts of that, right? We're seeing that in land. So here in California, we've been seeing extreme drought for many, many years. We're seeing that um, these, these are actually the signs that we see on the freeway or we used to see on the freeway in California um, because of the levels of drought that we're having here. Uh, in the Midwest, we've seen extreme floods happen, right? So some farmers who um, farm in the Midwest who already have been so vulnerable for so long talk about the fact that when these floods have happened in these last couple of years, their grain silos have actually you know, filled so much with water that they've completely exploded. And they're already so vulnerable economically um, as they're trying to stay in relationship with and steward the land that they're, they're never going to recover from that, right? So, so many farmers are being driven out of business by this already accelerating climate chaos and driven off of the land as a result. Um, and of course, part of what we're seeing is this dead zone in the Gulf. And so much of that is because, again, of the chemical pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers and things like that that are being used in order to grow the foods that we eat um, and pouring into our waterways. And um, this is, of course, you know, outside of the things that we've just been seeing even over these last couple of weeks, right? The massive snowstorms and the ways that people continue to still not even have access to power or clean water or things like that um, as a result of a failing infrastructure and failing economies um, that are, were just not designed for life to thrive. Navina, sorry to interrupt, but hmm. we cannot see your slides. You cannot see my slides. No, I assume you are screen sharing. Yeah, like I'm having all kinds of tech troubles now. Thank you for interrupting and telling me that. Let's try 
try again. Yeah? But yes. now we'll do. Um, I'm trying to find. So I'll just show you briefly. These were the slides that I was showing you. So for example, these are the differences that we see um, depending on what happens, depending on the choices that we make over these next few years. Uh, these are the differences that we're seeing. These are the kinds of impacts that we all know that we've been experiencing in our communities. Um, and of course, on the land in agricultural areas, the dead zone that I described already in the Gulf. And um, the impacts are not just on the environment or something separate, right? The impacts are also to the health of real people um, who are being impacted by these corporations. And when we look across the board at these kind of impacts that are happening in our communities, um, one of the things that we're also seeing is forced migration, right? So these images, we've, we've been seeing this in our own communities, probably we're seeing this all around the globe. These images are from a couple of years ago, but this hasn't stopped, right? That people um, are being driven off of the land in large part because of climate chaos and because of the kinds of um, wars that are happening as a result of farmers being driven off the land, people being unable to sustain themselves and nourish their communities. Um, we're seeing mass forced migration and unfortunately many, many deaths in the process um, because of these climate refugees um, being forced to go to other places in order to survive because it's safer for them and their communities to make these kinds of choices. And so really the purpose of this is us just naming this is the moment that we're in. It's not something that's happened just in the last year, something that's just happened in the last four years, um, but we're seeing this continue to accelerate. And it's because of decisions that we're making collectively as a society over what it is that we value. And some people say that what we're seeing actually is the apocalypse, right? Um, and if we go to thinking about what apocalypse really means, what the origins are of that word apocalypse, um, the word apocalypse translates to the lifting of the veil, right? So it translates to us being able to see and understand um, what actually is happening for each of us as individuals and our communities. Um, and it's really, showing up for us right now, right? It's really being illuminated right now in the face of climate chaos and of course in the face of this pandemic that we're all in together. And many of us a year into this pandemic remember that in the early stages, we really, were, this phrase was being tossed around, right? That the pandemic is a portal, that um, we have an opportunity right now even though things are devastating to really transform the ways that we do things together. That um, because of this mass crisis, that we'll see a difference in the prioritization um, where instead of putting profit first, we'll start putting lives, livelihoods um, of people and our planet before other things. And there's beautiful art that was made, there are beautiful stories being told, there are beautiful ways that people were um, coming together to try to make that a reality. And in the face of this particular crisis, this moment that we've um, been facing, we've also seen the kinds of choices that corporations and greedy politicians have made, right? So we've seen that um, food workers and farmers and families are being thrown under the bus, even in the face of this crisis, right? We see this in the headlines. Um, over this past year. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of debates happen in Congress right now around who's actually gonna get access to what as decisions get made. We have seen a huge increase. So there's, there's been hunger all along. There's been disparities around who actually has access to food, who actually can nourish their bodies here in this country. And we're seeing those numbers increase um, tremendously, right? So the last I saw was that one in three families here in the US are now food insecure. Again, this is the choices that we're making. It's not because there's a lack of food being grown. We saw already, you know, because of those chemicals, um, 
that are going into the Mississippi River. We're growing so much food, we're growing twice as much food as is actually needed for people, uh, but it's not getting to everyone who needs it. So whether it's fires, whether it's rain, <laughs> whether it's pandemic, whether it's heat, what we see is this continued prioritization of profit, this continued upholding of a particular kind of economy over the lives of many, many other people, um, particularly the people who uphold this relationship to land and who steward the resources that are needed for, for our own survival, again, and our own nourishment. Um, this is just one glimpse of one thing that we saw in that in the face of this decision-making that um, as the crisis hit, what, what became most important to folks was making sure that business as usual could be maintained. And we saw this um, tremendous uh, explosion of COVID cases at meatpacking plants because workers were not provided the care that they needed. They were not allowed to um, be in their dignity and to have uh, conditions that actually work for them or for their families. So no six feet of distancing, no pr personal protective equipment. Um, so part of what we're talking about when we're talking about restoring that relationship and really valuing our own bodies and our own lives is, is also valuing the lives and bodies of all people who are part of our food and agriculture system, um, the folks who steward us. So how did we get here? There's uh, this image that some of you may be familiar with, this image of Sankofa, which is from Ghana. And it's this idea that to understand where we're going, to have any sense of that, we need to look back to understand where we've come from. And uh, so when we look at that together, um, part of what we're talking about here in this country is recognizing that <laughs> this, this land has been indigenous people's land for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that prior to the colonization of this land, um, there were many different groups spread across the geography of this land who were living in some kind of reciprocal relationship with it, right? Not to say that everything was peaceful between all groups of people or that there, weren't, there wasn't any kind of fighting for resources, but that there is this idea of um, respecting nature, having a real relationship with um, the land that we're on and recognizing uh, that it's important to be in a reciprocal relationship with nature, right? So we can say that hundreds of years ago, before colonizers came here, there actually were thriving food systems here, that the dominant food systems that we saw on this land were relationships that were grounded in thriving ecology, thriving people, thriving communities, um, and a real understanding of uh, biodiversity and ecological systems and the cycles and the things that it actually took to sustain life on this land. So for example, in California, yes, there were fires. Uh, many of those were prescribed fires that indigenous people actually lit themselves in order to maintain that landscape. Many of these communities continue to exist today, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the story of what's happened in terms of who holds power here now. The other real critical piece for us to look at when we're looking at how we got to this place where we're investing so much of our energy, including our financial energy into upholding corporations and corporate power, is that the foundations of our food systems and the systems that we're living in today are so much grounded in not only that theft of land that we talked about, but also the theft of labor, right? The theft of people's lives. So people literally stolen from their lands in Africa, brought here, <laughs> brought to the East Coast first um, in order to grow things like cotton and sugar um, in order for an empire to thrive. Right, And we've seen that same colonization all over the world, right? So the British empire that upheld that is the same empire that came and colonized the lands that I'm from, came and colonized the lands that so many of us are from. Uh, there's actually amazing maps that look at the very small number of countries that were not colonized um, by these peoples. Um, but that that's the foundations of the systems that we're in right now, right? Stolen land, 
stolen labor, stolen lives. Um, that's where that's where we started from. And if we look then through history, <laughs> look at our collective story, at how decisions got made and who actually has held power in this system, um, we can see that over and over again, uh, despite many opportunities to make different choices, we continue to make decisions that were about the oppression of some groups of people, the exploitation of some groups of people, um, and the extraction of their labor, the extraction of life um, over and over again. So y'all can read this for yourself, but I think a couple of important things to note as we're looking through this history or that there are intentional decisions that got made like the Naturalization Act that denied citizenship to anyone who wasn't white, right? It's important to remember that that was an intentional decision that was made. Um, there were decisions that were actually made to make, make it so that indigenous people were forced to leave their land. It wasn't just about grabbing the land or moving further west, um, but that the Indian Removal Act, for example, actually um, physically displaced people from the land that they were on. Um, along the way, so, so that first slide that we're looking at is like the pre-Civil War, pre-emancipation -emancip slide, um, and then looking since 1860, so looking over the last 150, 160 years, um, we see that there are also some very intentional decisions around who gets to have a relationship to land, right? So for example, um, the Homestead Act in 1862, that essentially gave away land from indigenous people, that map that we already looked at together, uh, gave that away to white families who wanted to farm. They got 160 acres um, to expand, to grow food, um, and to um, move further and further west to take up more space uh, as this country and colonize more of it. There was a um, decision that was made or a proclamation that was made that all freed families would get 40 acres and a mule in the 1860s. That never happened, right? So there's this idea that black families who whose whole lives had gone towards upholding and profiting um, white folks that they would get access to 40 acres in a mule, but that never happened. There was, that was never followed through on. Um, and again, over time, we just see that decisions keep getting made over and over again to maintain a level of power and profit for one group of people, one class of people over so many others, including decisions like in 1887, that indigenous people, indigenous people to this land would get the right to vote if they were willing to disassociate from their tribe, right? So they weren't automatically granted power just because they're from here. Um, again, just to look through a few more things that happened in this last century, um, when we started, people started organizing, we started getting some bills passed. This is post-institutional slavery, post-chattel slavery. <laughs> the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in the 1930s. The way that it was passed, it excluded folks who held jobs um, or held positions that were um, formerly enslaved people's positions, right? So things like working on farms, things like domestic work, those were excluded from the protections like a 40 hour work week or guaranteed minimum wage or um, right to overtime or anything like that, right, to organize. Um, so these are very intentional decisions getting made, and again, maintaining power for some and not for others. And it wasn't until the 1960s that the Voting Rights Act was passed. Um, and even after that, that the last you know, native boarding school was closed, trying to uh, assimilate indigenous people to uh, one particular way of thinking and being. And it was because of folks organizing, right, that the Voting Rights Act was passed and that when Black folks got the right to vote, then many other people of color did as well um, as a result of that. And so why does it matter, right, that these decisions were made historically? Um, it, it matters because what we see today in terms of who actually has control and power and who is benefiting from these systems that we're in have so much to do with those roots of this food and agricultural system that was founded hundreds of years ago, again, on the theft of land, on the theft of labor. 
And we can look actually at what just happened in this most recent presidential election to see that when we, when we draw that map of who is voting what ways and where people of different ethnicities live and the you know, real deep urban rural divide that we've talked about, so much of that has to do with how land was redistributed to people, right? Who got access to what land and where folks live now. Um, so this is a beautiful map that was made that actually breaks down um, if we didn't look at things just in terms of the electoral college, but really looked at numbers of people and how people vote. Um, we see drastically different decisions um, getting made based on who has access to what land and who is where. So what does that mean, right, in terms of what we have right now? What it means is that um, we have amassed power in the hands of just a small handful of corporations. So some people say that the people who actually benefit from the systems that are causing the climate change, the climate chaos that we're all experiencing now and the kinds of um, disasters that so many of our communities are vulnerable to, that the number of people who are actually benefiting from them can fit on two Greyhound buses. That's quite the image, right? Most of us are not benefiting from these systems right now. It's a small, small handful of companies that are controlling so much of what we eat, so much of what we grow, so much of where it's grown and how it's grown um, and how that impacts us. We can look at this map in a few different ways, right? We can look at um, the consolidation of these corporations at the grocery store, right? So right now it's like four or five corporations that actually control um, the grocery sector and the, the kinds of things that we have access to there. This map itself is um, it's a little bit outdated. So uh, when you look at this, this is about the seed industry. This is a map from 2013, but Bayer and Monsanto here, they have now merged. So they together, just themselves, control about 63% of the seed industry. And what that means, if I can go back to that last slide, yeah. Um, what that means is that whoever is controlling those seeds, right? Whoever controls the land that we're on, whoever is making these decisions for us, whoever is um, willing to profit off of this crazy meat industry that's giving out greenhouse gas emissions and polluting our waterways, that's who essentially is controlling our lives, right? That's who's making those decisions for us. And we can look at this in a, in a few different ways again, financial industry, um, and it's amazing when you look at your own community, you know, I think wherever, wherever folks live, if you live in a city, there's some version of this red line, um, like there is here in Oakland, where you can see who has access to what, um, again, a small handful of corporations deciding, you know, where they're going to place things like supermarkets, so that folks do or don't have access to affordable, healthy, culturally appropriate foods that they actually can feed their communities with or feed their families with. Um, and we see this play out in so many ways, right? The, the corner store is full of the junk foods. Um, if, you, if you want to, you can play a little game with yourself with a slide that's on, with this image that's on the right and see how many of those brands you can name um, just by looking at a single letter of uh, their, their logo. Um, because these are so deeply ingrained, right? These corporations have had have just spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on the ways that they market to us, the ways that they um, have set up infrastructure and systems so that they are, you know, squeezing out real people, squeezing out real families, um, and having very significant impacts on our own health. <laughs> it's something like one in two, this is pre-pandemic numbers, right? But one in two young people of color expected to develop diabetes in their lifetime. Um, so many of our families in, in Oakland where I live and in many cities around the country, diet-related chronic disease has been the leading cause of death because of these corporations having so much control over what it is that we actually are able to put in our bodies. So part of what we're talking about here when we're talking about this, mass corporate control of, of our system and of our food system is what, what will it actually take for us to reclaim our bodies, right? Reclaim bodily autonomy um, and actually be able to be in a relationship with the things that sustain us. 
um, in ways that are culturally appropriate, where everybody has both the right and the means to procure or produce or prepare or share food that is actually good for them and good for each other and doesn't exploit anyone else along the way. And part of what we're talking about when we see all of this is that we often have this idea or we shame each other around making better choices um, that we should just be eating better, right? So, so many of us like, um, Today, I mean, I'm curious to hear from other folks like what you ate for breakfast, but today, you know, like all I had was like a piece of toast and then later I had some other like little snacky things. I had some Cheetos yesterday. You know, there's, uh, it's really hard in the systems that we're in to be able to access good food that is actually good for other people, good for the planet and will actually sustain us, right? So the, there's a study that was done uh, about 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit more, but it said that there's only 2% of our food in this country. Hopefully that's expanded by now, but only 2% of the food in this country is food that's actually good for people, good for the planet, and is affordable, and it doesn't exploit people along the way, right? So what I'm talking about, <laughs> is us getting to a place where we are collectively um, defending what is sacred and recognizing that it is our lives and the land that we are on that is sacred. In this economy that we live in, this economy that has been built over the last several hundred years continues to tell us that profit is more valuable this pandemic and what we saw these corporations do told us that profit was more valuable than people's lives, than working people's lives, that um, profit is more valuable than biodiversity or our waterways being able to thrive. Um, but what we're talking about is that our lives actually are more sacred, more valuable than any of that. And even through the history that we've been in, even through that struggle of um, decisions being made for us <laughs> um, and decisions being made around what is most valuable, even through that, our people have resisted, right? So indigenous folks have fought for their land. We can look back, um, that's happened over hundreds and hundreds of years, but we can look back even just the last 50 years. So some of you may re re recognize this, um, but this 10 point platform is from the Black Panthers here in Oakland, right? Where the Black Panthers um, starting in the 1960s actually set up the first free breakfast program for their community with the intention of, we will take care of ourselves. We will take care of our people. Um, our people are valuable. We are going to nourish each other. They started that first free breakfast program, which turned into a national breakfast program that's at public schools now all over the country. And we're, we're seeing that expand even more and more. Um, but folks fighting for land and bread and housing and education. Um, you know, Malcolm X said it during that period that all revolution is in the land, right? That that's the basis of freedom and justice and equality. And we know that. We know that the capitalist system that we're in, we know that the economy that we're in really um, starts with us changing that relationship to land and how we're able to steward that um, rather than extract from and exploit it. And we know that people have been saving seeds, um, connecting to cultural foods, doing this in ways that hold um, life as something that is more sacred. Uh, we know that our folks have been organizing to grow food in their own communities and feed each other, right? And to do that out of this sense of love for our people, for our families, for our communities. And we know that folks have been resisting in so many ways. Um, so I just wanna go back to a couple of these slides actually, um, cause I think like this one in particular is very important in this moment that we're in right now. Uh, remembering that so many of our peoples throughout time, whether it was during the um, during the 1800s when indigenous folks were 
uh, fighting for black folks who were enslaved or in the early 1900s when Japanese and Mexican workers were organizing together um, in the beet plants or in the 60s when the United Farm Workers and the Black Panthers were organizing together or in these last few years when um, folks all around the country have come together in defense of black lives. Uh, and we're, we're seeing the ways that our people continue to resist and continue to hold life as a more sacred thing. Um, we saw this at Standing Rock, right? Where um, indigenous people in particular, but people from all over the country came together to defend um, life, knowing that water is life and that um, that is more precious to any of us than profit. And it even made the New York Times headline. Um, and, and this image, which this is so inspiring to me and uh, brings me grief at the same time, but this image from indigenous people in the South Pacific who are not the ones who caused this climate chaos by any means, right? But they are um, facing the brunt of it and they are resisting it and they are defending their land. Um, against it. And of course, we're seeing in my homeland in Punjab and in India, where millions of farmers now are taking to the streets and people are taking action to ensure that it's not corporations that control the food system, not corporations that are making decisions around agriculture and what the laws will be, um, but are fighting for themselves. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop that share for a second and um, invite us to be in a little conversation together around what it takes to get there. And um, one of the things that I draw inspiration from when I think about what it takes for us to completely transform and disrupt this system that has been in play for hundreds of years, um, if not thousands of years, but hundreds of years in this land, is thinking about folks who actually organized to end slavery in the first place, right? So um, they knew that they were up against an enormous machine um, that was benefiting from the, this idea that people's lives, people's bodies were disposable. Um, the slave trade essentially said that it was cheaper it was more beneficial, it would um, profit the empire more to continue to import people from Africa, have them work in the fields, um, carry them across these ships where they were in very crowded conditions and many people died along the way. It was more profitable to do that than to actually treat people well and make sure that they had what they needed. And there was a small group of people in England um, that included somebody who had been a doctor on one of those slave ships <laughs> and included um, a handful of Quakers and it included a student <coughs> who uh, for a writing assignment <laughs> had to write a powerful essay. And for his essay, he decided to study what was happening on the slave ships and he wrote about it, he exposed what was happening on the slave ships, and he was so moved by what he learned that he started organizing with this group of about a dozen Quakers, this one doctor that he had spoken to, and the, the dozen or 13 or 14 of them together uh, went into a print shop and started creating materials to tell the story of what was happening on these ships, right? How people were living in terrible crowded conditions and how abhorrent it was. They started doing things like street theater. They started organizing with the first ever, what we know, um, that we know of, right? The first ever like door knocking campaign and making buttons for people and getting people to sign petitions, not to say that they wanted to end slavery completely because they knew that that was out of the realm of possibility, right? People were not willing to give up their, um, their tea at the time, right? Or the ways that they were benefiting. Um, but they knew, that if they could expose the conditions that folks were living in or the conditions that folks were experiencing on those ships, that they could potentially end the trade, right? So by 
um, exposing how horrific the trade itself was, they were able to make it less profitable for, um, for these ships to keep passing the Atlantic to bring more and more people to what's now the United States. And uh, by effectively organizing over the course of 10, 15, 20 years during that time, they were able to end the trade of people. And by ending the trade of people, that is what led to ultimately spurring the end of chattel slavery as we knew it, right? Um, because it was no longer profitable to be transporting people in that way. And so folks were forced to change things. And so part of what I am thinking about in posing this question to us, to think about what it might be like for us to confront systems that are so big, systems that have so much control over our bodies, over our relationship to land, to our own lives, to our own labor, um, to the 21.5 million people who now work across our food system, right? And who are still treated as disposable today. Um, what are some of the ways that we can organize together in order to make that sweeping transformative change possible um, if we have a vision that is rooted in true transformation, right? Rooted in our true liberation and rooted in our collective liberation for all people. And at the, at the Heal Food Alliance, we think about that in terms of really bringing together the folks who are most negatively impacted right now. So when we look at our food system, and I am just gonna show a couple, uh, just two more slides if I can. Um, When we look at who's most impacted by our current food system, we can see that we across, across the board, right? Production, distribution, and consumption, we know that there are frontline communities in rural and in urban areas who are being um, hurt in very intense ways, whether that's public health issues, um, whether that's our families not having access to enough uh, food or good enough wages to be able to afford good food, um, our people not having access to land, and there's so many policies in place that make that the case. Um, but we're, in so many ways, we're divided, right, across that whole system. We're divided by geography, we're divided by race, we're divided by sector. And we know, similar to those folks in the South Pacific, that those who are on the front lines of experiencing the most negative consequences of our current food system, those are also the folks that are at the forefront of the solutions, right? We know that the people who created this problem, those people that fit in the two Greyhound buses, the small handful of corporate CEOs that actually control our entire food system and the greedy politicians that are benefiting from them, those aren't the folks that are going to figure our way out of this crisis, right? It's going to be those of us who are experiencing the negative impacts of the system as the way it is that are going to do that. And so what we think about is how we bring together the frontline burden communities who have the solutions for changing the system and how we organize together to make the transition that not we not only want, right? This is not just a matter of want, but our very survival depends on our ability to see that these issues are completely interconnected, that our communities are interconnected. <laughs> and it's up to us, just like those Quakers and that student and the doctor organized together to make it politically possible to make that transition happen. It's up to us to make it politically possible for us to have systems where we can be in right relationship to land, where we can be in right relationship with each other, um, and we can be in right relationship with and nourishing our own bodies. So what 
we're trying to do together is organize through a few different leverage points to make that possible, right? To dismantle that corporate control of our food systems and to invest in um, our own communities and our own community power and to do that from a place that really values our lives um, and the sacredness of all life over the sacredness of profit in this economy. So I'm gonna pause there with my presentation, um, leave us with some time to have conversation. Um, and I'm happy to get into more details about HEAL itself and how we do the work, if that's helpful, if people wanna talk more about that, but I wanna just like pause us there and be able to have some conversation together. <laughs> 